that is the biggest danger that we are facing. And I would also like to mention very quickly to Vikram that there was an author, 14th century author of five books, uh, Thakura Bheru, who invokes Alauddin Khilji in one of his books as Ashwapati Mahanarendra Alauddin Badshah. So you should also read this literature. It is in Apabhramsh laced with Prakrit. It is a book on metallurgy, on mathematics, uh, Ganit, Kaum, Kaumudi. Uh, these are books written during the Khilji period where the people who lived under these regimes remembered the rulers, not as how they are being remembered today. Yeah, I would add to this, uh, you know, Ramya Srinivasan's work on Braj Bhasha, Alison Bush's work and uh, Ramya's, and she has looked at this poetry in the courts of the Rajput rulers. And in the court poetry in Braj, there is an invocation of Akbar, and he's likened to Lord Krishna. So just adding to Najaf's point that histories are these also. So it's not just about we should study this and we should study that, fine. The sources of the times actually say something very different. So I think some way we need to pay attention to that as historians. Dr. Vedic, uh, do you want to be serious? Uh, okay, yes, please go ahead. For a court poet or a court historian to liken uh, the king to, to God, uh, I think is also uh, not something that should surprise because that's how probably uh, the court poet also made a, a livelihood because you know you have to extol the emperor that I don't know how much of that actually proves much of a point there. But then to Najafji's uh, you know, point that you know something catastrophic is happening now, I'd like to draw the attention of uh, the panel and also the listeners to, um, I mean, Outlook magazine in 1989, I think came out with this uh, article which talked about a circular that was uh, uh, circulated by the West Bengal government, which was then under Marxist rule, uh, a circular dated 28th April 1989 uh, for the West Bengal, uh, you know, secondary education board. Uh, and this was the government of Bengal actually advising this, uh, the entire board to re review all the history textbooks uh, for the state and with specific instructions, and I quote from that circular um, as it is, Muslim rule should never attract any criticism. Destruction of temples by Muslim rulers and invaders should not be mentioned, unquote. And the, the in fact, I'd got a copy of that circular too uh, sometime and saw what, what was this hullabaloo about. So there were these two specific columns. And since it was a, all Bengali books, Ashuddho and Shuddho. Uh, you know, Ashuddho or all the impurities, so to say, in the textbooks, which uh, these worthies in government were reviewing, uh, anti-intellectualism much, uh, and Shuddho, the uh, so-called correct version. So any mention of any kind of, uh, you know, uh, atrocities, any kind of destruction, any kind of uh, pillage or genocide, all this came under Ashuddho. And the Shuddho part was just delete this. And the most extensive deletions, if you see in that circular, were in regard to a complete chapter on Aurangzeb's policy on religion. So that's why I'm saying it's, uh, it's nice to be alarmist and say something catastrophic is happening right now. History has always been the handmaiden of the ruler. Uh, so a, a court poet will have to, just as a court poet in medieval times would have to extol her king as a uh, incarnation of God in democratic times. Uh, it's the most of the historians who would, and these books and these circulars, which actually tow the line of the ideology of the time. So if it is being rewritten now, it was rewritten sometime else. So this battle is what also makes the subject interesting. It makes it uh, that much more. Otherwise, it's a, it's a static fossil that all of us are staring at. So it is so malleable because everybody can mold it in the way they want to. So uh, the common thing is for the sake of national unity, we should not talk about uncomfortable uh, chapters of our past because somehow it is assumed that even mentioning all of that uh, somehow ruffles today's unity or whatever, uh, which is, I think, uh, being very, very unfair to communities today, the albatross of all these invasions and these barbarities do not lie on people of today. But by whitewashing it, by airbrushing all these excesses and saying, oh, but 
it's going to be very sensitive. There has to be national unity has to be maintained. So we're not going to talk about it. Uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that happened in South Africa, which ensured that all these uh, you know, uncomfortable topics are spoken about. Uh, I think history offers also that space worldwide uh, where uncomfortable topics can be discussed about. You can uh, openly uh, come together, heal the wounds of the past and move on. If you do not heal those wounds, if you keep passing the muck under a carpet and then putting deodorant over it, uh, I think it has a it has a tendency to resurface itself in pernicious ways, uh, whether it's in politics, it's in society or clashes and all kinds of uh, other uncomfortable things we're seeing today. So truth and reconciliation and this Ubuntu, which I think Desmond so, uh, and Vic, Nelson. Vic, Vic, that, uh, thank you for those Vic, thank you for those wise words. But I think this message sort of pay, falls on deaf ears on all sides. Even if we look at the people who are asking to bring out all the ugly facts about the Islamic atrocities and all. Let's just focus on the Bengal example. None of these nationalists want you to focus on the Maratha invasion, the repeated yeah, Maratha invasion that's, on Bengal and Bihar. That's not, that's not case, Ajay. The, the I mean, fact is it doesn't fit into their narrative. It doesn't fit into the narrative. The fact that yeah. hundreds of thousands of Hindus were massacred by this sort of Hindu nationalist, the Marathas, that narrative doesn't fit. You talk about the Marathas or the Bengalis not talking about the Islamic atrocities. Who's talking about the Hindu atrocities on the Bengalis? Look, do, that's it, why I said it, 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 it selects, it, isn't it selective fact, fact uh, picking on all sides that's going on? You know, I think Sorry, uh, I the way okay. uh, Mughals had their court poets, we know who are the court poets today. So, uh, and court historians today. So, you know, uh, I think uh, I'll give the platform to Professor Heather, who's been wanting to say so, something. Exactly. So, yeah, say patronage. So, no, yes, forget, poet, forget quote poets, uh, Vikram. Uh, look at the autobiography of a 17th century Jain merchant, a very small merchant who was a poet, writer, and deeply religious. Now, look at what he has to say about the Mughal Empire. He was the one who was teaching the Jaunpur governor, Chin Kulich Khan Sanskrit. And he writes that every day I go to him and he treats me with respect and I teach him because he doesn't know Sanskrit. Now, he fell from the stairs when he heard the news that Akbar was dead because he thought that the world had come to an end. Now, he was not a court poet. You read his autobiography, which I have, which is in Madhya Desh Ki Boli, which is Avadhi and Braj. Uh, and you get a picture of the Mughal Empire. He had nothing to do with the Mughal state. He was an ordinary merchant. So the picture which you get from that autobiography, which I teach every single year to my students, the first lecture begins with his autobiography, where you have a picture of ordinary people living everyday life with a state which is somewhere there, looming large, but they think it is protecting them. So that kind of a notion is under challenge today. And that state is being demonized. So that is something that really worries me. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heather. I have a question from the audience, and this is specifically for Dr. Professor Habib. This question comes from um, the, the author Abhas Maldihar. So he points to your book, Akbar and his, and his India. Him, you have mentioned, um, you have mentioned how Akbar suppressed Muslim sects, which were considered heretic by the orthodoxy. You talk about Akbar, how Akbar orders exhumation of Mir Murtaza Shirazi, a Shia buried in Delhi for the great proximity to that of Amir Khusro, a Sunni. Uh, <clears throat> you also talk about how Akbar suppressed Madhavism so how, how but, but then what uh, baffling is then how do you conclude that Akbar was um, tolerant? Well, um, and yeah, I mean, that, that's basically the question. Yeah. Well, actually, this is a question of period. Akbar began his tolerant measures immediately as far as Hindus were concerned. Immediately after... His, he assumed power in 1560 
when dis after dismissing Bairam. Now, uh, he abolished the pilgrimage tax, he abolished jazia, he employed, began to employ Rajputs in the bureaucracy. Uh, he began to give grants to ordinary Hindus, to temples, all in 60s. <coughs> but at the same time, among Muslims, uh, there is a curious hostility to uh, non-orthodox sects. But the Mughals accommodated Shias and Sunnis, but they had these, these prejudices against Mahdavis, for example. And, um, but Akbar changed his, uh, but that didn't affect the Hindus. This was an internal, internal issue among Muslims, but Akbar changed his attitude totally after 1580. When in fact he became, began in, assumed a neutral position towards Islam. In fact, in official documents, Professor Habib, instead of lots, we sort of losing Professor Habib. Um, <clears throat> I think, in, in terms of time, we'll also start moving towards um, the Ahmadi Kesh, which is equivalent to Muhammad. So we, lo we had lost you for a minute, you had frozen. Yes, between two. Well, um, no, I was saying that. Uh, Akbar's, there are two periods. One was after 1580 when Akbar totally became neutral towards Islam. I mean, his officials, the like uh, Abul Fal could, did not call Islam religion of Islam as Islam, but Ahmadi Kesh or Mohammedanism. So that period lasted till his death. So this is a di distinction to be made. The main social reforms also came in due, during this period. Thank you. So basically, he sort of evolved during his life. But I think what you pointed out earlier was this is the difference. One has to see what period you are referring. Yes, exactly. But as far yeah, as the Hindus were concerned, the, the, there was no difference. I mean, the tolerant policy continued. Yeah, I think that is the more relevant point uh, that we have to consider the period and relatively. I mean, this was the period where inquisitions were going on in the other major powers. Uh, at the time, and there wasn't really a concept of uh, accepting uh, different schools of thought and having any kind of tolerance to dissent. So this is the period in which he lived. It's a bit unfair to compare him when we are aware of modern democracies and all. Um, <clears throat> okay, with this, we are moving. To, uh, we are running out of time, so I want to move towards very brief concluding remarks from all of you. Once again, thanks to all of you for coming today. This was. Uh, it's an honor to have this to be hosting this panel. And I really apologize for the technical difficulty we had during the, during the session. But can I uh, start with the conclusions? So um, we'll, I'll start with Dr. Heather and then we'll move, on, move along with just very brief uh, concluding remarks and where, what you suggest is the way forward. So uh, you were on mute. Uh, I would reiterate my position that there's nothing terribly wrong with Indian history writing, while at the same time acknowledging the possibility that historical research should expand in different ways and history writing historian should be responsible, not tendentious, not selective, even though they can have preferences. The moment a young researcher chooses her theme she expresses her preference. You can call it bias, you can call it anything. And at least in my university, luckily she is allowed to continue with her research. So as long as we have this freedom, academic freedom, and not obliged to function to a rhythm which is not our own, then we can actually write very good history. Uh, because we have the ability, and I have been Professor Habib's student who taught me how to read very difficult scripts, which I am trying to pass on to my students. These uh, texts are very difficult to read, and there will be time perhaps when nobody would be able to 
decipher these. So nobody realizes that medieval historians have this additional responsibility of deciphering documents. Their documents are not in English and are not easily comprehensible. So the first round is to decipher these difficult documents, cull whatever you think is meaningful and relevant, and then organize your material to write. Now that exercise is going on. We don't advertise it, but that is going on. And of course, I totally agree that regional history, provided you have sources, provided you do not invent characters. And the final thing I would like to say, which I used to, which I say to my students, don't fall in love with the past. Don't fall in love with the characters of the past. Don't have villains and heroes in the past. As long as you keep that distance, you will be able to keep your sanity and professionalism and write good history. Okay, um, Supridaman, are you on? Uh, yes, yes. Um, no, I think uh, I think there's uh, just to round up. Just uh, we we do have, we have to distinguish between the meta question that you know you've put up for debate, uh, and the very specific instances that we brought up, whether it's about Aurangzeb or whether it's about Savarkar, etc. Uh, and about the meta question, I think uh, I don't think there's that much disagreement uh, across the panel. That you know, history writing is, is is something that's constantly in motion. Things are, you know, constantly being uh, revised. Things are constantly being uh, recontextualized. Things are constantly being reinterpreted. And I don't think uh, anybody would, uh, would really dispute this. Uh, and um, there is an interesting thing that Professor Heather has said, and that is about language. And I think uh, uh, that is something that uh, you know that we that we should all remember is that actually uh, history writing is very, is a very complex, time-consuming, uh, and uh, difficult business, and um, it does require uh, knowledge of uh, of multiple languages, scripts, etc. And that's something that actually requires a lot of investment from from either side. Uh, and um, actually, I think that that should be one key takeaway from the debate. If uh, uh, you know, if we're going to have one takeaway, but on the meta question, actually, I think most most panelists seem uh, seem broadly agreed. I don't think anybody has really uh, said that there's anything against uh, revisionist history or rewriting history. That I, that's that's part and parcel of our jobs. That's what we do. Oh, thank you, Doctor Singh. Talk, can I invite you, Doctor Vedic, for your concluding remark? Yeah. So. Um... I want to go back to that moment about subaltern studies and, uh, and go back to the craft of the historian. So the historian practices their craft in the present. That's we can't get away from. We write about the past in the present. So a lot of the political atmosphere of the present, the, uh, the historical location of the historian impacts the kind of questions they ask of the past and the way they practice their craft. Yeah, so, so subaltern studies, that big shift came about in historical writing or those questions were being asked because the, those historians lived through a certain moment of history which impacted their sense of self and that impacted their craft. And subaltern studies is one of those defining sort of uh, moments in historical writing because it not only impacted, it coalesced with postmodernism, postcolonialism you know, working class histories and impacted history writing, not just in India, but in Middle East and um, Latin America and elsewhere. So I want to return to that, uh, sort of taking on from there, not return to it, drawing on that. I feel that we inhabit a similar historical moment where we are being asked to justify our relevance, where the historian, the liberalism is uh, on a, you know, the, the relationship between historical writing and liberal ideas is being questioned. You know, historians, our relationship with our present is being uh, questioned. There's a growing anti-intellectualism in the public sphere. So, and we are also having to engage with the limits of our professions, which uh, with attendant anxieties. So keeping these questions, like engaging with these questions, uh, and these questions, something I've been asking myself for a while now, what do we do with our craft? How does it impact our craft? And I think the answer lies in more public history. Now, I'll just take a moment to talk about public history. Now, public history, I'm understanding in different ways. One public history is where the historian writes for the public, 
rights for the audience that is public and not just their peers and for people within academia because that changes the form in which we practice our craft. So far, our, our discipline has been catering to all of us write for each other. And because sometimes the writing is so complex that you can't, you can't make it digestible to the public. Yeah, And that has actually led to a lot of research lag, like the, our research reaching the public, getting into the textbooks, or getting into public sphere. So more historians writing for the public, where the public is the audience. Second is shifting our gaze from, and this is, I know this is not possible always for medieval and ancient history, but more so for the modern period, which I practice, shifting our gaze away from the colonial archive. Because ultimately all said and done, as you know, Professor Habib and Najaf have highlighted, historian is tied to the archive. The archive is what separates me from a literary practitioner. We are all writing narratives, we all construct narratives, but there is a very vital difference between what historians do and what literatures do. And that is, I am tied to my archive. I cannot, I cannot move, I am tethered to the traces of the past. So for the historian today, modern historian at least, I think there has to be a shift towards, a little bit shift towards away from the colonial archive and, and institutionalized statist archives to community archives. And community archives are archives created and owned by communities. Because the belief is that the traditional colonial statist archives are also spaces of erasure. There are several things that don't get talked about or certain ways, like for the revolutionaries, the only way they appear in the archive are as anarchists and criminals. They never appears, they rarely ever appear as revolutionaries. So if I have to look for revolutionaries, I have to go elsewhere. Right. So so that that is what I mean by moving to community archives, looking at community histories. And, uh, and therefore ma making, uh, making uh, history writing more meaningful to the people you write about. And the third uh, element of public history, and this is one of the projects we are running, uh, uh, this, this is a British Academy project, which is basically co-creation of knowledge between academia and the public and engaging with the possibility of that. Because as, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Sampath has been trying to impress upon us, and he's correct in that, that there is a sort of a, uh, there is the, as if the wagon has been taken away, run away, the academics have gotten left behind, the wagon has been taken away by the popular. And the popular is no longer reading the stuff. I mean, they never read the stuff we wrote, but more so now they're reading WhatsApp. Yeah, they're reading uh, social media. So that is what has happened to us. That has, and, and that is filtered with propaganda that is, you know, filled with so much other stuff. And anybody can become a historian. Now we had a long tradition of amateur historians who were honest to the material that they encountered and they witness now that is that may not be always the case. So co-creation of this knowledge between academia and communities is very important to get the public to participate in the narratives and then for us to um, uh, engage with each other's narratives and produce epistemes in that manner is also very important. So that's really the way forward. We need to acknowledge the times we live in. So even academics can't get away from it. Yeah, I'll stop Thanks, here. Dr. Vedic. And uh, Vikram, can I ask you to go next? Are you on mute? Yeah. Am I audible? Perfectly. Yeah, I think in conclusion, I'd like to say, Yajur, that you know, when I, as a as a practicing historian and someone who's uh, involved with the discipline, I when I think of history writing, I'm reminded of that poem that we read as kids, you know, the blind men and the elephant, uh, where different blind men touch different parts of the elephant, and one said the elephant looks like the trunk, someone said the elephant looks like the tail, someone thought it was the the body of the elephant. Uh, they were all right, uh, all correct, but they were all partially wrong also, uh, because the they were touching parts of the elephant that were uh, available to them. And that they postulated that this is how the elephant looks. So history writing to me is very similar to that. We, we are all, you know, uh, glorified blind men searching for those uh, needles in a haystack. And based on whatever is available to us, the documents that speak to us, the archive that speak to us, the languages that we are, we rely largely on English, which limits our uh, entire Indian history to just 250, 300 years. So the wealth of information in several Indian languages, uh, classical 
classical languages, all of that uh, will give a more holistic idea of how this elephant looks. So that humility that needs to be there within uh, all of us as practitioners, that uh, this is not absolutist. This is not the truth. Naiti uh, naiti, as they uh, always uh, said in Sanskrit, that na iti na iti, this is not the end. There is always scope for revision. And if someone else finds some other part of the elephant in the picture that emerges is going to be very different. And that is one reason why, you know, you can write, you could, could have written, you could have been the most celebrated historian, court historian or otherwise, uh, if there is something else that comes up at a later stage, uh, which uh, kind of your, your, your most well-researched, well-written, well, -written, well, -written, well uh, you know, publicized uh, work can also be thrown into the rubbish can uh, if some new discovery, some new uh, fact comes about. So that humility uh, of uh, us being co-travelers in this journey to rediscover our past and not have this intellectual arrogance of uh, this is what it is and there is nothing else to it and uh, to allow the mushrooming of multiple views, to allow the flowering of a million flowers uh, and let all of them make this composite uh, story come alive. I think that is very important uh, and not to look at every uh, attempt in a, uh, in a derisive manner and to let, I mean, there are good, bad, politically motivated, uh, like I uh, you know, spoke about that circular. So there are circulars written then, there are circulars written now. Uh, all of this will keep happening till the cows come home to, uh, uh, you know, uh, for forever. So we'll let that be, but as professional historians, as historiographers, uh, I think to have that sense that we are all in it together to, to rediscover our past, I think that's very important while, while talking about a country as complicated as ours, with a history as, as vast, as fractured, as difficult, with so many interactions, with so many contemporary issues also that come into the politics of it all. I think that is very important for all of us and to pass on that to the future generations as well. Thank you, Vikram. Um, and finally, can I invite you, Dr. Habib, for concluding the debate? Well, thank you. It has been a, an instructive discussion. Um, but um, I would say that we have been somewhat harsh on historians who have written on the national movement. But Gandhi was a towering figure. I myself wrote, a, wrote two small books on the national movement and had found much to criticize in Hind Swaraj. But the greatness of the man, if somebody doesn't recognize it, then I think there is something wrong with him. You can't compare him with other individuals in the national. They may be mentioned, and in my book you will find that even Savarkar is mentioned. But uh, uh, the greatness of the man in his final hours much is spoken about history, but who speaks about the great slaughter of 1947-48? In the throughout the world after World War II, it was the greatest slaughter and migration. Still, despite what has happened in Indonesia and others, nobody in this discussion spoke about that, which is totally ignored in our volumes. And the one man who stood against it was Gandhi. So how can one even compare anyone with that man? I think there is something wrong with a person who says that he has been overpraised. Nothing, no praise is enough for Gandhi. So one must recognize not only facts, but also generalities. What was the impact of the man? What did he do? How many people he protected who would have otherwise been slaughtered, both in India and Pakistan? So clearly, behind this business of rewriting history, which the RSS has now been raising, and look at RSS's own record in 1947-48. They, they are being I would rather say that in most books on the national movement, there have been uh, 
their rule has not been properly assessed and condemned. How many of them celebrated Gandhi's death? I was a young man of 16 at that time, I knew. So there are many corners of history which for politeness we are not mentioned. That's just politeness. But if this kind of thing is opened, let those things also be opened. What you did, what did you do against the English? How did you celebrate Gandhi's death? What were you talking, saying about Gandhi? What about Savarkar's role in Gandhi's death? All those things also are parts of history. So when you talk about rewriting history, let it be spread over all the, the, the entire range, not just the ranges you pick, not your Nazi-like love of Aryans. I mean, I don't see any difference between what Hitler said in 1933 about rewriting German history to prove that Germans were the original Aryans and the UGC circular saying that there was no Aryan invasion, but the Aryans went out from India. India is the home of the Aryans. What is the difference between the two? So this rewriting stuff is just to present a false history of the Indian. There is no reference of the, to the caste system in ancient India. No, no, no reference to how Dalits were treated, how Shudras were treated. But the caste system begins in medieval India according to their syllabus. So this kind of rewriting is totally, um, is not a, at all due to academic concerns. It is not at all due to nationalist concerns. It is simply because to create a false and fictitious history for the Indian, which any respect, uh, self-respecting historian will never admit. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Professor Abhi. Vikram, you wanted to make a quick point? I'd just like to add, I think I kind of agree with what Professor Habib said. There has to be a holistic view of, uh, um, you know, people, their contributions, their roles. So like he says, one has to assess the uh, the role of certain individuals, organizations. We should also then also assess the role of the, that organization like the CPI played in 1942, uh, you know, in the Quit India movement, where uh, there are documentary evidences of how they were acting as spies for the British. Uh, Sir uh, Richard Tottenham, the additional secretary in the Home Department, or Sir Reginald Maxwell, the Home Member, to whom regularly details of the underground movement, the uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, or the INA, all these reports were being given by PC, uh, CP Joshi, who was the Politburo member of the CPI. So yeah, all these things also need to come out. Similarly, uh, for, after the heinous a crime of the murder of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, what has not been told to most people in India that there was also a, a carnage against the Maharashtrian Brahmins, very similar to what happened in 1984 uh, against the Sikhs, only because the assassins belonged to a particular community. Uh, these, have, uh, these have just been airbrushed saying such a thing never happened. And that's why I come back to my other point that please uh, you know, let history offer that space where we recount these, uh, not selectively whitewash and airbrush depending on uh, your convenience, your political inclination. Let everything be mentioned there. there. There needs to be that truth and reconciliation. And every the role assessment of everybody, every individual, the omissions and commissions of all of them put uh, on paper, every community's angst uh, uh, also, uh, you know, put there. And with that healing, we move forward. Uh, so, you know, we've, done, we've made peace with our past. I think in India, we've not made peace with our past. And that is why the past has this ominous uh, manner of resurfacing itself in very, very dangerous uh, way. Uh, in different spheres, whether it's in politics or society. So strangely, I do agree, but I would like to expand that and not limit it once again, limiting it to one particular group or so, so on. So let's have a frank discussion about everyone and everything under the sun. Uh, if you're talking about the murder, let's also talk of the aftermath of the murder. You can't talk about one and then omit the other and then say that is complete history. So the elephant, if you have to understand, the blind men need to all come together and uh, put together the explanation of all the parts of that elephant, only then you will get a complete picture. Thanks. 
thanks to okay dr hedo to get the so please keep it brief if you want to yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is just a counterpoint to uh sampath's uh, metaphorical elephant and the blind man i would liken the historian to another blind man and this comes from a medieval persian text a blind man was walking with a lamp and people who passed by asked him why are you carrying a lamp you are blind and his answer was it's not for me it's for you that you do not knock me down <laughs> um thank you i think there is a uh, thank you dr heather thank you dr vedik thank you professor habib and thank you vikram dr sampath uh i think the point about whether india has not yet made peace with its past or whether the established peace is now being disturbed for various political agenda is a topic for another debate it going there is a there is a lot of strong views and convictions there so we'll keep that for another day but for now thanks to all of you for coming to argument with the indians it was an honor to host all of you and uh, i learned a lot listening to your perspective thank you thanks a lot i hope to have you again with us in the future namaskar thank you ajur thank you